Hi, I'm Brad. In this channel, I've kind of put myself in a weird predicament where I'm constantly looking for new things and putting myself in sort of a research circle that can drive me kind of mad. In fact, it's no surprise that I'm a little bit crazy and this stuff makes me crazier. But what makes me even more crazy is people in the comments sections, while mostly is very respectful and a lot of great conversations, you'll sometimes have people that tell you, these things cannot exist. Ever. And during this quiet time, I decided, hey, let's make a video about something that did exist. In fact, it just didn't come out, but it totally existed. And it was backed by one of the largest chip making companies in the world. Now obviously the VR and AR industry is moving towards standalone. Standalone this headset, standalone this headset, Apple's making a desktop grade standalone headset, Deckard is going to be standalone PC VR, blah blah blah, everything like that. And a lot of my research kind of points to that, whether that's a good thing or not. I think over time it's a good thing, because even standalone headsets can still sort of connect to outer servers or really other edge computing units such as a PC. It's a win-win. But usually when I talk about the Valve Deckard or even the Apple headset sometimes, people think the idea of being able to have these desktop grade chips inside of a VR headset seems impossible. I mean, we're used to the Quest 2, which is using a Snapdragon uh, SoC, basically from a mobile phone from a few years ago. And people think that's the best it's gonna get anytime soon. And I get that. That's kind of honestly my fault too. In fact, before the Quest 1 came out, I kept hearing these murmurs that Oculus was working on sort of this inside out standalone completely you know using a mobile chip and it was gonna be able to do 60 VR with amazing graphics and processing and I really kept telling people and myself like that just seemed very unlikely I was one of the naysayers of course when the quest 1 came out yeah that quickly changed and then the quest 2 came out and that very quickly changed so I had to bite my pride and realize okay maybe software wizardry can actually solve a lot of the problems that hardware has. But again, the Quest 2 is really still mostly a very small smartphone SoC. We're not getting any desktop grade performance out of these chips anytime soon. At least by themselves. In my research of Valve's next VR, AR, whatever headset, the Deckard, I've been sorry pushing this idea that Valve has partnered with AMD to make a SoC that would be able to run the entire Steam OS 3, which is similar to what the Steam Deck is running, and I've even pointed to comments made from some of Valve employees saying, yeah, that's what we're really interested in doing. But people would keep coming at me and say, hey, that's x86, that's very different than an ARM SoC that's something maybe like Apple's working on. There's no way they would be able to get PCBR grade performance in a standalone headset. So that led to this video, which I'm going to be showing off a product that was announced literally six years ago. It was the world's first standalone PC VR, AR, and VR headset. Yeah, it did both. Mixed reality. Touching around the release dates of both the Oculus Rift CV1 and the original HTC Vive, AMD went to GDC 2016, which is the game developers conference, where they showed off a partnership with a company startup known as Sulon. Now, Sulon was a Toronto-based startup. Uh, they were not really new to the ARVR game. They were actually releasing, or at least showing off headsets previous years. But this one was very different than the other ones they've shown off. They partnered with AMD to make a fully standalone PC VR headset that ran on Windows 10. Back then. 2016. It was powered only by an AMD FX 8800p APU with built-in Radeon R7 graphics chip on board. Now while that chip was definitely the backend for all the graphics and compute processing, there was also another chip that Sulon proprietarily created to work with the chip. In fact, it was designed for the chip to work together. It's what they called a proprietary spatial processing unit that would help with all sort of the inside out tracking and actually mapping your environment so you can overlay stuff with mixed reality, AR, and VR all together. The device had four cameras. Not much information on the resolution of those cameras, but it was at least full color pass through with the demos that we've seen publicly. The device ran with eight gigabytes of DDR3 RAM. Wow, you know, DDR3 sounds so old now, but I remember back in the day, that's pretty much what I had too, running the original Vive. It just, just feels really old. Crazy how that happens. And it had 256 gigabytes of SSD onboard storage. The display was pretty standard. It used one display similar to how the Quest 2 uses only one display and they would split up a digital IPD, which uh, the overall display would be 2560 by 1440, which would equal about 
1280 by 1440 per eye, which is actually right between the Vive resolution and what would be the actual index resolution. And it was still OLED. And again, it ran on Windows 10 and it had support for Vulkan, DirectX 12, and yada yada yada, AMD's Liquid VR, which would help with the motion compensation. That still is pretty much in use today for a lot of their sort of graphics processing stuff for VR. Now, before we kind of talk about what happened to this device and really this company, because again, we, I mean, this was six years ago, obviously didn't release to the public, but AMD did show it off uh, at GDC and they were very proud to show it on their website. Like there's even some Wayback Machine uh, archives of them actually showing it off on their VR section of their page with the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. But really, before I go on to talk about it, I kind of dug deep and was trying to find some demos from sort of that conference, and I found one. Only one. Now, the device they brought to GDC was not completely working. It was not really set up for that area, but people did actually get to try on the hardware and see how heavy it was. We'll get into that in a minute. But they did show off a actual demo, what they claimed was actually from their office, and it showed an AR to VR kind of process. This video only has 136 views on YouTube. So I really felt it was important to show it off and really it was a great idea to get the ideas of why mixed reality and really AR to VR can be really immersive. Even for me, who's been very skeptical of the usage of AR, uh, really thought this was an amazing demo. So I'm just gonna play the video and then we'll talk further. Or you can just skip ahead. Here we have an example of what some of the experiences that can be created. The environment is actually mapped in real time and it's, the AR object is overlaid onto the real scene. And uh, what the system will do is actually dynamically virtualize your environment in real time as well. That means that it understands everything about the environment right down to the minuscule uh, pixel levels that it brings in. It's able to transform your environment into mixed reality experiences. And here you'll see the ground being torn up by, uh, by the technology that's in, included all in this all-in-one headset. The ceiling gets ripped up. And all these pieces are actually a part of this, uh, uh, of your real environment. It doesn't just stop there. Eventually, we'll get into the VR level of the system. As you can see, all the crumbled parts of your living space is actually on the floor of this, uh, surrounding this beanstalk. So this is cool. So I can take my, my office, for example, and I can, uh, you know, keeping it sort of spatially real, sort of paint it however I want, I can have a, a beanstalk grow up through the middle of it, have the roof explode if I'm just by putting that on. This is not concept footage, this is footage, this is actual footage. Oh wow. And that this is, is our crazy. front foyer of our Sulon headquarters. As, wow. As we speed up a little bit of the areas for time's sake, the a giant's gonna come down and he's gonna grab you at waist high. And then he's not going to you know leave you lightly. He's gonna bring you up through that hole and take you into a virtual reality immersive environment. And this environment is completely beautiful, running off AMD technology, um, and it's able to produce stunning visual quality graphics running on an OLED 1440p display. Um, and as it, as it speeds up, you'll see that the environment around you is, is really well designed, it's really quite vibrant, um, and uh, here's where, uh, as the story goes, you can actually get the full video off the internet and, uh, and with the full audio um, and uh, audio visual experience to, with, with, this, with this video, this yeah. demonstration. Very, very As cool. you saw there, for a brief moment, the, the player actually looked down at the room, and you can actually see the, the actual environment that you came out of. That was, that was our office space. He's gonna eventually put you back inside this, uh, this environment. Well, that's, that's super, super cool. Yeah. Totally crazy, right? I mean, I never was excited about mixed reality in terms of entertainment until I saw that. It really gives you the idea of why I kind of went on this rant uh, a week ago or a few days ago about how VR and AR could really replace the television because television can't do anything like that. But yeah, what happened to the Sulon Q? It just disappeared as if some sort of giant being from underground the depths of VR hell dragged it so no one else could see it for the rest of the days and it just disappeared. Well, literally almost right after that, uh, the company would go silent and doing a lot of digging, it was actually appeared that they actually were acquired by some company, silently. Just a little rant here. I'm getting a little sick of going into old research and trying to figure out what companies might have made some silent acquisitions. I really think silent acquisitions in general should be illegal in this industry or really just in general. 
The big blow when I found out that Meta was the one that actually acquired Imagine Optics, which I believe might have been right under Valve noses, that's speculation, really just kind of dug deep in my brain and thinking, huh, the fact that Meta seemed to have pushed a lot of NDAs on every employee involved in that to make sure that no one would actually tell who acquired Imagine Optics back then, probably to hide from the actual issues going on with the FTC right now. Yeah, I really think that silent acquisition should not exist and every acquisition from especially large companies should be reported publicly. I don't care if it shows off what you're working on. That's just, it's madness. But yeah, they were actually acquired by some company, the entirety of Sulon. Asking around people in the industry, no one's really for sure who acquired the company, but the biggest belief is that AMD actually was the one that acquired them. Usually though, when you do have these silent acquisitions years later, you can kind of go back and look at the employees, of, or at least former employees of the company, and see where they landed afterwards. And really, all the engineers and a lot of the people that worked at the company sort of scattered all across the industry. It wasn't an obvious situation where a company acquired Sulon and then hired everyone under the office, at least publicly from what I can see from LinkedIn profiles. But there were a couple of employees that would eventually make their way to AMD, and there was really one employee that actually really kind of stood out to me. While they did not work at AMD right after the Sulon acquisition, they did actually would go on to work on some of the bigger projects at Radeon Technologies at AMD, which would go to create stuff related to the Xbox Series X and S and the PlayStation 5. But the most noticeable thing on his resume is that he was heavily involved with the Steam Deck. I've been saying over and over that the plan to have a Valve Deckard standalone AR-MR headset, which I'm actually, yeah, believing it would have a lot of AMR capabilities, a lot of stuff related to that is happening in the Steam VR code, that it would run with a AMD partnership. Not only just for the actual chip itself, which would be probably very similar to the Van Gogh chip we see in the Steam Deck, but also custom tailored with some other partnerships. I have high beliefs that AMD is also involved with the display manufacturer I've been talking about, which was related to micro OLED. But really, if you want to know more why I think that, that would probably require one of those ridiculously long Q&A streams where I just kind of go off and off and off with my madness that just wants to pop out of this brain. But AMD has kind of been very big in the VR industry, and I have to remind you that VR and AR is sort of the next generation of spatial computing, or just computing in general. That brings a lot of job security for anyone that works on silicon chips. So I want to actually compare the chip that was in the inside the actual Sulon Q with what is in the Steam Deck now. At least very basically. I'm not very good when it comes to the actual processes related to silicon and the actual nanometer processes, but I can at least compare numbers. Like an idiot. The most notable thing is again, the sort of graphics GPU architectures are obviously very different. That was back in the uh, R7 days, which man, it also feels like sort of a nostalgia trip thinking about that. Whereas today we're on RDNA 2, but that's not really a good comparison. A better comparison is really looking at the actual nanometer nodes that these sort of chips were built on. For anyone that doesn't know what a nanometer process is, especially how small they can make all the transistors fit on a chip. And the nanometer process for the actual chip for the Sulon was 28 nanometers. For those who are wondering what the Steam Deck nanometer process is, the Steam Deck Van Gogh APU is running on 7 nanometers. That's about one fourth the size of the actual process used in the Sulon Q. Usually when you shrink down the actual nanometer processes, you get obviously way more transistors to be able to fit on the board and a lot of times better energy efficiency. That kind of shows also with the fact that the Sulon Q used a 35 watt uh, TDP around there was the average TDP, whereas the Steam Deck is rated officially to be around 15 watts as its average current for the Steam Deck. But despite that lower power of the Steam Deck APU, the APU GPU power of the Steam Deck is about two times at least in terms of GFOP's performance over what was in the Sulon Q. Technology progression is really amazing. And this was the best time to make this video because literally this morning as I'm writing this video, or really the outline for this video, AMD has announced that they're about to finalize their acquisition of a company known as Xilinx that also kind of works on custom SoCs and computer chips and uh, field programmable words. And AMD basically said that there's a lot of new markets popping up and their acquisition of the Xilinx would be very useful in making even more custom tailored chips for those sort of new categories that would need more volume as time goes on. 
VR and AR probably fits that criteria perfectly. In fact, Xilinx is no stranger to VR. There was a headset called the OSVR that actually ran uh, on Xilinx FPGAs, if I remember correctly. So for the people that question everything I say about the fact that we are getting very close to desktop grade SOCs built into VR headsets, again, the big benefit is this Sulon Q was ginormous. It had to use giant lens cups and sort of probably passe cooling systems on much higher nanometer processes. Shrinking down these lens cups into giant little tiny, giant little tiny, thin little lens systems related on pancake optics and stuff related to that with smaller, thinner displays allows companies to pack in a lot more SOC and cooling power into headsets for greater performance. These things really ruin things. So yeah, that's really all I wanted to talk about. Really don't be surprised about all the amazing advances we're about to have in VR AR technology because we are right on the cusp of something big. Truly the next sort of thing in entertainment and also spatial computing. I know people have been saying that for a while, like even since the research on consumer VR and AR, but the more I look into this stuff, the more I feel like I'm just right there on the horizon. I'm just waiting for that release and just grab it and put it on my face. Anyway, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe, Patreon links, and all that other garbage in the description below. And uh, next video, I'll be talking about this Super Bowl commercial that Meta made. Sort of like a Chuck E. Cheese knockoff, but um, I actually liked it. But not for the reasons you might think I liked it. Bye!